Hi, I'm Owen from REST Australia. Thanks for tuning in to the REST Network. Before we get into today's show, there are a few things we have to go over. Firstly, what you're about to hear and see is limited to general information only. It's not personal financial advice like you'd get from a financial planner. Also, it's important to remember that past performance is not indicative of future performance. That means that anything that's happened in the past, or we say today, is not necessarily going to reflect what happens in the future. Lastly, please consider that any of the guests or myself are featuring on this program may have a financial interest in some of the products or shares mentioned. That's enough from me. I hope you enjoyed today's program. Kate, Monique, welcome to this episode of the Australian Finance Podcast. Welcome to part two of our ETF investing mini-series. Yes. What are we talking about? Well, all of this week, we're talking about ETF investing and making sure you've got the confidence and skills to research and invest in ETFs and sort out your financial future. Well, yes. This is 102, Monique. Yep. We just graduated. Now yep. we're going to talk about some more interesting things, like we're going to go in a few different directions. I'll scratch the surface just a little bit on some other ideas. Nice. Can't wait. Can't yes. Wait. So if you're new here and you do not know what we're talking about, I would recommend heading back to part one and listening to that first, where we explain what ETFs are. Uh, we use some chocolates, so it's lots of fun. We just ate a few. So now we're getting ready to walk you through um, what we look at when we're trying to figure out what invest we what ETF we want to invest in. Yep. And then this will help us kind of segue into future uh, episodes where we talk about other things and we use more examples. Okay. So if you haven't already listened to episode one, as Kate said, please go back and listen to that. And we, we may bring up a box of favorites. That was our example of an ETF. So Kate, what are the types of things we're going to be talking about? Yeah. So in today's episode, we're going to talk a little bit about risk profile and working out what type of investor we are, because that's really important when we figure out what ETFs we actually want in our portfolio and how much we should actually be putting in each one. And if we are a um, high risk investor, what that might look like versus if we're maybe a low risk investor and we don't really want to take much risk with our money. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk a little bit about ethical investing and how that works with ETFs. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about the core and satellite approach that Owen briefly mentioned at the end of part one. We're going to talk about actually working out where on earth do you want to invest? Do you want to invest in property or Australian shares? Do you want to invest in the US tech companies? Like figuring all of this out. When you might want to use ETFs versus another approach um, really working out what you're looking for and how do you actually learn more and some resources there and where does this ETF actually fit into your strategy and finally, does it matter how big the ETF is? Mm -hmm. There's a fair bit to cover, so let's crack on. Um, risk profile. Do you know what a risk profile is? No, please tell me. Well, uh, I might uh, firstly ask, do you know what risk profile your super is invested in? No idea. No idea. Okay. Yeah. So... Risk profile is a bit of a tongue twister because the way we define risk in finance can get a bit complicated pretty quick. Right. But some ways, so say if something is low risk, what we mean by that is we think that as you know, finance people, we actually think that um, it's not going to bounce around a lot. Okay. It's just going to bounce around less. Right. right? Uh, and that's called what we call volatility. Yeah. Um, so... You know, an investment um, that's low risk might only fall on average one in every 10 years. Okay. So it might go backwards. How right? do you know something is low risk though? We'll get to that in just a minute. Um, whereas something that might be high risk might go backwards one in every three years. Right. But the idea is that the more risk you take up until a certain point, eventually it should pay off. Even though it's a bit bumpier along the way, Mm -hmm. taking more risk tends to result in better wealth. Right. So a good example would be shares are riskier than cash in the bank. Yep. Right, because cash in the bank pays you interest. You know how much interest you get, the bank tells you. Yep. Um, the chance of the bank, you know, losing your money is almost like next to zero. Yep. But if you invest in shares, they're probably going to go up or down 2 3 4 5% in a day, and that's normal. Yeah, right. Right, but over the long term, if you just look at the Forbes rich list, none of those people keep their money in a bank account. Yeah, okay. They all took risk. Yeah. Right, so wealth is basically a, a product of taking extra risk. Okay. So the more risk, calculated risk you take, not just like go and buy something crazy, um, that's how we kind of think about risk as a general thing. But Kate, 
you know, we've got examples of like low risk things there. How do we determine what would be low risk? Maybe what's an example? Low risk portfolio versus a higher risk portfolio. Yeah. So risk is very personal. And if you do have a look at your super fund, you'll realize that it a balanced portfolio with your super fund looks very different to another super fund. So in this way that it's kind of hard to work out and it kind of you have to start with working out what your tolerance to risk is because you might absolutely love bungee jumping and you, you're fine to take the risk because it's worth the reward to you. But I would could think of nothing worse to do. Have you ever, you'd have never bungee jumped. I have never bungee jumped, but okay. I was talking about Understood. it with someone yesterday and it sounded like a terrifying activity. <laughs> okay. Yes. So whether you're willing to take um, your willingness and capacity to take risk with your money. Yeah. And so if you're thinking, okay, I'm really scared about investing. It's really new to me. I don't know what I'm doing. I do not really want to see my money fall in value. Then you might think of yourself at the beginning and your risk profile can change as a low risk investor. So that might be also called conservative. So you might say, I want... I want 80% of my money in cash because I do not know what I'm doing. I'm very scared of this thing called investing. And I'm just going to put a tiny bit of my money, my overall portfolio, into shares or into bonds and things like that. And so this is taking a very low risk approach because most of your money is safe in a term deposit, in your savings account. Maybe it's under your bed as well. And you're just putting maybe 10% of your portfolio in shares. And I would say that's quite a low risk portfolio because Overall, if you look at the cash as part of your portfolio, as well as the shares, that's seen as quite a low risk, a conservative approach. And so your portfolio would be a lot smoother overall if you look at it like $100,000 and $10,000 is in an ASX 200 ETF, $90,000 is in cash. Then the drop, if the ASX 200 ETF falls, in the context of that overall portfolio, including the cash, is a lot less severe. So the opposite would probably be true, which is that um, if you had 80% or 90% of your money in shares and shares ETFs, uh, you would be a higher risk investor. So that would be we call a higher risk investor. And Kate mentioned your capacity and willingness to take risk. Um, we, by the way, just in case Jesus, you're going to ask this question, yep. is if you have cash for like your um, you know, lifestyle, so like if you have rent or a mortgage or something, yep. that is not what we count as cash in a portfolio. Okay. So there are like two different types of cash. Yeah. There's like one that funds your life mm-hmm. and then there's one that sits in your uh, investment account. Okay. Right? So when we say cash, that's what we're referring to the cash that's in your brokerage account, not the cash that's for a rainy day. Yeah. That's what we call an emergency fund. That's separate. Yep. Okay. So that's the first, I guess, point of clarity there. Um, and, you know, like ca- Kate said, willingness and capacity, uh, you don't want to invest until you've got that emergency fund. Why? Because if you go and invest in shares, let's say you bought the IOZ ETF mm-hmm. and you put all of your money in that, right? And then you're like, holy heck, my mortgage repayment needs to come out tomorrow. And oh no, my IOZ ETF just fell 4% because yeah. it was like a bad day or whatever. Then you're like, I now need to sell my IOZ ETF, but it's worth 5 or 4% less yeah. to pay for something that I should have seen coming. Right. Right. So the emergency fund is designed so that you don't have to sell your investments. Yeah. And so just keep that in mind as we talk about this stuff is we're separating those two things. Yeah, totally. That totally yeah. makes sense. Yeah. And that comes to the portfolio allocation because you can – structure your portfolio in a way that works for you. And often you don't quite work out your tolerance to risk until things actually happen, until Mm -hmm. you, it's very easy to think I'm happy to go all in. I'm 100% high growth investor. I can deal with anything. And then when you see your portfolio fall in value, which it will, because that's a natural part of the market, because businesses aren't going to do great all the time. There's lots of factors happening in the economy. So if you see your $100 portfolio fall to $80 $80 or $70 and that might it might be like that for a while that's very scary and yeah. so it's really hard to properly understand your tolerance to risk until it actually happens and that's why we really like building a diversified portfolio where we have some Australian shares US shares we've got some property we've got some cash maybe we have some bonds and we structure it in a way that we get a good mix that makes us feel comfortable that we can ride out the ups and downs. We're still going to see it fall, but it potentially won't fall as much as it would if it was just in 100% um, US tech stocks. 
just some general thoughts from Kate and I. I would just say that if you look at your super fund, it's normally a pretty good like guesstimate of what you should be kind of focusing on if you do have your own share portfolio. Mm-hmm. So if you look at a super fund, um, what they call balanced, yep. normally what they say when they say balanced is they normally mean it's like 50-50. Okay. Right. So it's like 50% in what we would call riskier investments, so like shares. Mm-hmm. And then there'd be, and property would be in that too. Okay. Um, and then there'd be 50% in less risky stuff. Right. So that would be like uh, cash. We mentioned uh, an ETF before that just does, um, like it just invests in term deposits yep. for you, basically. Cool. Um, bonds, those things would be on the less risky side. Okay. Now, um, even though, you know, we, we do have a tolerance to risk. So you, you know, you, you might go and bungee jump. I might not do that. So maybe your risk, even though we're similar age, mm-hmm. you you might go and do that and I might not, which means I'm probably more conservative. Right. Now, the thing is, another thing that we need to think about is our timeline. In the first episode, we talked about how long someone should be invested in it. You asked me how long like, would you want to invest? I said yeah. five years minimum. Yeah. Now, if you're, say, 64 years old and you plan to retire at 65, I would be saying, well, you shouldn't have all of your, in fact, you should probably have less of your money in the, the shares because the shares could go up and down in the mm. next year and we don't know what's going to happen. Okay. But because you're relatively young, you probably don't need the money for a long time. You should kind of default to being more aggressive, like higher risk. Right. Now, this is up for debate, but for most younger people that don't need their money for 10 or 20 years, um, it should be like closer to almost all growth. Okay. Right. But the problem that you have when you do that is you can expect it to bounce around all the time. And like I said in the first episode, four out of five years it might go up. Mm-hmm. On average, right? But one of those five years is going to be pretty scary. Yep. And you're like, what the hell is this investment <laughs> yep. thing? But for the most part, if you just you just look back over 100 years of history, for the most part, on average, the stock market tends to go up. Yeah, totally. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's why we do it. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. What and do you I think, think of that it? There are some ways you can reduce your risk as investors. Like what I said, diversifying, not putting all of your eggs in one basket. You want to be invested in different things. You also don't want to invest everything at once. So if you're a new investor listening right now and you've got $10,000 burning a hole in your pocket and you just want to do something with it, it would not be our advice to invest all of that money in one thing at once. Especially as a new investor, you want to put your toe into the water before you dive in. You want to make sure it's deep enough. So you want to maybe invest, start with $500 and invest on a regular basis. So you might invest small chunks every month. And that's a way to reduce your risk as well. Yeah, because yeah. you might be, if it's, if you've got 10 grand, you like you rock up to the stock market and you're like, I'm going to chuck it all in today. And then tomorrow it falls. You're going to feel terrible, yeah. right? But if you just chuck $500 in today and it falls tomorrow, you're like, huh. Oh, I'll just put another five hundred dollars in yep. at lower prices, yep. and then if it goes up the next day, you'd be like, "Huh, I'll just put another five hundred bucks in." Right. And so you kind of like it's regret minimization. It's also, yeah. Yeah. you know, as a beginner, you're you're not going to go in and just go straight into the deep end and be like, "This is what I'm doing." Yeah, no, totally. <laughs> um, we would advise breaking it up, and yeah. that we get this question not just from people that are in their twenties, Monique. We get this question from people that are in their sixties, yeah, okay. and they might have just sold it their their property, or they may have just cashed in their super, yeah, or something like this. And they're like, "Should I just invest it all at once?" And we're like, "No, <laughs> no. same rules apply. Yeah. It doesn't yeah, matter how totally. much you have. Like, start slow." Yeah. So it's like you said before, if you're older, um, obviously you don't have that much more time compared to those people in their twenties. Like, what should they do? Well, they would. The thing is, like, even at sixty five, you're still going to live for like 20, 30 years. Right? Yeah. So even for people at that age, we would still say you do want some shares. You don't just want to take no risk because yeah. if you do, then your money is just going to, you're not going to make as much growth from your yeah. money. So you want to make sure that over time you still have a good mix. Okay. They used to do this. This is, just, this is not what we advocate for, but there used to be this old rule of thumb, mm-hmm. right? And it used to be 100 minus your age is the amount that you should invest in the stock market. Okay. So let's say you're 25. Yeah, 100 minus 25 is 75 percent in the stock market. So yeah. that'd be like through share ETFs. Yeah, right, that's what we mean by stock market. Yeah, and then the other 25 percent you might have in cash, mm-hmm. or you might have it uh, in a bond ETF okay. or something like that. So the lower risk stuff. Um, but that's just that's a rule of thumb. I don't probably advocate for that too much anymore because even at 30 years of age, most of us have a very long time before we need the money. 
Yeah. So you can be more aggressive yeah, for most right. people. But if you want to retire at 33, you probably don't want to have it all in the stock market. Maybe mm. do, maybe don't, but probably not. <laughs> Another way to reduce your risk, Monique, is by education and actually understanding what's... So listening to this podcast, doing our ETF course, actually knowing what you're doing when you're investing is a much... It's a really good way to make sure that when your money falls in value because you've invested in shares, you don't freak out and sell at the bottom of the market, which is unfortunately what a lot of investors Mm -hmm. do. They second guess themselves. They wonder why they even got involved with investing in the first place. And they sell when their $100 has fallen to $70 and they lock in that loss. And often they will be too scared to ever get back into investing because this experience has put them off. So not only do they lock in a loss and they lose money because they have sold when the market has fallen instead of investing for a long five, 10 plus year time frame, they also don't invest again. So they miss out on any future gains as well. And that's really sad when we see that and we hear stories about that Mm. because um, it means people have lost a lot of opportunity to build their money and and build their financial future. But I think education is really important. If you are wanting to be a higher growth investor, really understanding what you're doing um, does help there. Yeah, for Mm. sure. If you don't know anything about investing, like even from episode one, do not be call yourself a high growth investor just yet. Yeah. There's so a, like other than listening to this podcast, where else could you learn all this stuff? Yeah. About? So the podcast would be good. Just go back and listen to the back catalog. Yep. But um, you could take our free courses. That would be a great place to start. Um, you can read books. There's heaps of wonderful books out there. Like the Barefoot Investor is a good start. Yep. Um, there's other books like uh, it's a bit different, but Rich Dad Poor Dad. If you want to get into how the stock market works, there's one up on Wall Street. There's a heap get of books. Get started investing okay. by gets, our friends at Equity Mates. Yeah, and... get started investing. Um, there's heaps. So yeah, those types of books. In fact, there's probably more beginner investing books. There's probably like it's probably like ten to one. Okay. Like everyone's written a beginning. So basically, investing. read a lot. <laughs> read a lot. Yeah. Well, the best investors happen to have two traits in common. They are really good at reading, and they're really good at writing. Nice. That's it. Just happens to be the case, okay. and I don't think that's a coincidence. It's just they kind of want to learn. Um, the final thing is like, uh, so when we talk about uh, high risk, we can also call that um, high growth, because basically, when we take risk, what we're doing is we're going for growth, um, and when we talk about low risk, we can call it conservative, but balance is somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. So just keep that in mind. Um, And there's the final thing, which is just ESG, and that stands for environment, social governance, and all basically, and another word for it is an ethical investing. Okay. Yeah. Kate, do you want to elaborate on that or? Yeah. What is that? That's when your values come a little bit more into play. And we mentioned before in the last episode about that box of favorites where you just get everything. It's transparent. You know what the top 200 companies that are in that box are, but you can't customize it. You just, you pick that box and that's what you get. But with ethical investing, there's now ETFs available, which might invest in the top 200 companies, but they'll strip out certain things like mining or gambling or things that we might know as sin stocks, potentially that don't align with your values. So there's a lot of different options when you're researching ETFs. And it's something to think about. That's why we're just throwing it in here as something to sit at the back of your mind. If that's something you're interested in, there are ETFs that allow you to invest in large Australian companies, large US companies, but put a bit of a filter on. Of course, it's their filter. It's their rules. You still can't customize it, but it is potentially a little bit more in line with what you want to invest in. Okay. Yeah. So that's just, as Kate said, with the favorites box, it'd be like only investing in Turkish delights that are like sugar-free. Yeah, right. Yeah, something like that. Uh, and it's very popular and it's grown in popularity. There's a lot of debate about it. It's really contentious, but it's uh, it's definitely something that we see emerging okay. as a popular thing. Like people want to be more hands-on. Yeah. And they don't want to invest in casinos and they don't want to invest in yeah. all of those, you know, vices, which we call, yeah. you know, like even some like really contentious defense contractors, for okay. example. Yeah, so, oh, that's cool. Yeah. So... Um, th- we mentioned it briefly in the first session, which was this core versus satellite. Yeah. So do you remember the analogy? Oh my gosh, you're putting me on the spot. <laughs> uh, remember I, I did this one with my fist and yep. the thing going around the outside. So it's like the main thing in the middle yeah. and then you, you can do like the thematic ones on the outside. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So this would be like, so in the middle, this is where we talk about our diversified portfolio. If we go back to like risk profiles, yeah. you want to focus on this first. So you want to be like, I want to get my core right. It's be like going to the personal trainer. They say, you got to work on your abs and you got to get your, you know, your balance right. 
And then you go and look at the things around the outside. You take the risk and you try and do other things. And so a core versus satellite approach is we want to get that core right. Then we'll talk about the things around the outside. Whereas most people tend to go the other way, particularly males. Sorry, guys. <laughs> we tend to start with the really super like out there kind of ideas like, hey, what do you think of Tesla? Or, hey, yeah, like this lithium, m- lithium or this mining thing that's unproven in Africa. Like, let's go and invest in this. We're going to be millionaires. Yeah. That, that doesn't really work. You yeah. want to start with the center and then go and do that stuff. Yeah. So this is where we talk about the core versus the satellite. Yeah. Mm. And the core's a lot less exciting. It's just going to be those staple things in the middle of your portfolio that you're going to be investing in on a monthly or every second month basis for a long period of time. And it's just right. become you can even automate it and it's just going to be that staple core part of your portfolio. And your super fund does something very similar. They have yeah. a very simple core portfolio often yeah and so there's there's a lot of debate about what should go in that core portfolio and again the risk profile comes into play but in the core portfolio you might want maybe a certain portion of your portfolio in Australian companies so you might use an ASX 200 ETF and we've mentioned a few but that might be part of that core of your portfolio so would you choose like the safer options for that core yeah so you're wanting there's always going to be risk when investing and the market's going to fall, it's going to rise, it's a long-term thing. But ETFs is what you would probably put in your core, especially as a beginner, because you don't really know which individual companies are going to do well over a 10 or 20 year time frame, And that requires quite a bit more skill and research and time to dedicate to it. So we want to get people invested more early on in their journey. And so ETFs are a good way to get that core started early right. on. Mm. Because- you just need to choose a few ETFs to put in that core instead of having to pick 20 or 30 different companies. And that's a lot of work. Mm. Yeah. So that's where we, yeah, so that's where we would focus. And you're right. Like t- you can start in the middle when we say we want proven. So we talked about ETFs that have been around for a long time. So making sure that they've been around for at least three years. Yeah. Um, we don't want their fees to be too high. We're just drawing a rule, in the, like a line in the sand. It could, like, we say not more than zero point five percent. Yeah, that's the average. Yep. So we say just stay below that. Yeah, right. Um, we don't. We want to pick the boring ETFs that are easy to understand. We don't really want to put anything complicated in there. Yeah. Because the idea, Monique, with this part of the portfolio is just imagine that you buy these ETFs, and you still have them in twenty years. Mm-hmm. So you don't want to pick the thing that's really hot right now, and then in three years it's dead in the water yeah right so pick the really like boring low-cost long-term things things that have been around for a long time and then around the outside that's like you said you can take that risk okay cool and so that might be things like individual stocks or it might be even people that have like crypto in their portfolio even if if they consider that an investment they might put that in as a satellite position okay yeah so you put like if we go back to our ten thousand dollar example before Mm -hmm. you might have you might split it up so that $9,000 $9,000 is what you're going to invest in your core and then $1,000 in your satellite. Okay. Some people would say you don't even need the satellite, which is fair. But, you know, if you want to do that, that's by all means. Go and give that a crack. The point mm. is get your core right. Yep. Okay. Cool. Yeah. And I find a lot of people do want to dabble or do want to try something new. And so we are definitely not saying don't do any of that, <laughs> but we want you to the 90% or 95% the core, we want you to do simple, low-cost things mm. in it. Yeah. Kat, did you want to talk about um, ETFs and overlapping ETFs, like not having too many of one? Yeah. Yeah. So I think when people get started, they can end up uh, finding so many different ETFs and it gets really exciting. And then they end up with 10 ETFs in their portfolio and suddenly it's become very complicated. And we would probably say, oh, what's the maximum you probably should have in your core, maybe like five or six. Yeah. Yeah. You probably don't need more than that, yeah. to be honest. Yeah. So you're using... If you're buying an ETF to give you exposure to the top 200 Australian companies, you don't really need to have two ETFs that give you exposure to the top 200 Australian companies. Yeah. Like one does the job because they totally. invest in the same thing. Yeah. So you might want one ETF investing in top 200 Australian companies, one ETF in top 500 US companies, one ETF potentially like developing markets or real estate investment trust or whatever you have a particular view of in your portfolio. Mm -hmm. But you want to make sure you have a quick look at the holdings when you have a look at the ETF provider's website to make sure you're not doubling up on particular holdings. Because if you invest in two Australian ETFs, suddenly 
you're just crossing over all of the holdings. You're getting BHP twice. Yeah. Mm. And what happens if that does happen? Like, Well, no, the world's not going to end. It's <laughs> going to be fine. But it just means that um, you might be making your portfolio a little bit more complex than it needs to be. Um, you might not have the most simple approach that you could have. And you want to keep your costs down when it comes to brokerage fees, which we'll get to in part five of this series, but because you have to pay money to buy that ETF. Mm -hmm. And if you're doing it on a regular basis, you just want to reduce the costs there. So having only a few ETFs in your portfolio that represent the core that you want yep. um, is, a, is a good way to do it, keeping things simple and reducing the, the cost to keep buying in. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So nothing, nothing bad yeah. happens. It's just <laughs> potentially it's just increasing way to go complexity, it. and yeah. you're just sort of getting overlaps you don't really need. Yeah, yeah. It's just like you'd be buying like instead of the favorites box, it'd be like someone just puts a different sticker on it, and you end up getting the same stuff anyway. Yeah, and there's really no point. Doing yeah, that. just pick the best one yeah. and go with that. Yeah. Yeah, because um, the interesting thing in Australia with those core ETFs, because they're so popular and so many people want them in their portfolio, every ETF provider makes a top. 200 okay. Australian company ETF. And so they're all quite similar. And in the next few episodes, we'll get into how do you actually do that comparison process and make a decision. But when it comes to the thematic ETFs, maybe only one provider offers this particular robotic ETF in Australia. But when it comes to core, there's often a few choices. So you kind yeah. of just need to choose one. Okay. So like your example is the IOZ ETF. Yep. That's the ticker symbol for the one that you bought. Yep. If you own that, you wouldn't go and buy the VAS ETF, which is mm -hmm. the, the Vanguard equivalent, basically. You wouldn't buy the A200 from BetaShares. Yep. It's pretty much the same thing. Yeah, they're all kind of doing the same thing. Yeah. So, I mean, you could have both in your portfolio because you might think, well, you know, this one's actually dropped its fees now, so I want to okay. put more in that, but I don't want to sell my old one. Yeah. Well, there's so, the main reason for choosing either one of those, like the fees. Yeah, pretty much the okay. fees. Yeah, there are, sometimes there are very subtle differences that they try and market to you and say, oh, but this one does this tiny little thing, but it might only be like 2% different. Yeah. In which case, you'd just be better off going with the one that's cheaper anyway. Okay. So it's only if they're like really different. Yeah. Like there are some ETFs in Australia that do invest in Australian shares, but they do it in a different way. Mm -hmm. In the first episode, I said how the biggest companies normally make up the biggest part of the ETF. There are some things, there are some ETFs that don't do it that way. They just say, nope, everyone gets the same size inside the ETF. So if there, this is an example, if there was 10 inside the ETF, 10 different shares, all of them are 10%, right? As opposed to the biggest one making up most of the, the ETF. And that's just the way they try and differentiate themselves. But for the most part, uh, yeah, you can just check what's inside the ETF and make sure you don't already have that kind of thing right. in inside your portfolio. So... Um, I guess a question is like, when do I use an ETF over something else? For the most part, an ETF does basically a lot of the things. It's like a Swiss army knife. If you think of ETFs as a whole, it kind of does a bit of, they do a bit of everything. So you can get it at ETF and invest in shares, bonds. Like we said, there's the, the cash ETF. Gold. So gold. you don't actually need to go and buy your own gold and Ooh. find it yeah. yep. safe. And a lot of people over the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, um, maybe that's a bit long, but over that period of time, a lot of people will probably end up just using ETFs. Okay. They probably won't invest in individual shares. And that's definitely the way that we see it going with our members is we see our members voting with their wallets or their investment wallets and preferencing ETFs over just about anything. Right. Because if you think about it, an ETF, if we talk about it, it's like a basket of things. The only real limitation of what you can basket up is what the ETF provider can go and buy for you. Okay. So... You know, if there's unlimited amounts of chocolate, if there's unlimited amounts of fruit, those things would work. But if there's something that's not, you know, unlimited um, and easily found, um, that's where you, there's a limit. So a good example of this would be like residential property, mm -hmm. right? So let's say I said that you could invest in different types of property yeah. through, but you could you could own Metricon. Yep. Remember how I said that? Yep. You could own shares of Metricon because yep. it's a property company. Um, but if you wanted to buy an actual house... It doesn't really work because with an ETF, you want to be able to buy and sell it every day. Okay. So you can't buy and sell a house every day. No, that, that'd be pretty difficult. <laughs> yeah, because you, you know, you own a house. Yeah. So you would know that you've got to get a loan, you've got to get it settled, you've got to agree on a it's date. It's a process. <laughs> yeah, so you can't buy and sell that every day. No. So that's an example of something where an ETF wouldn't work. Um, there are some other examples, like if there's really small companies. Mm-hmm. 
sometimes small companies don't have enough shares available for everyone to buy in. Okay. So this is not enough shares. Like I said, there's only 100 shares available for someone to buy. Yeah. In all of Australia, there's only 100 shares left. Yeah. You can't have an ETF that wants to put those shares inside of it because the ETF will just take them all and then there'll be nothing left. Right. So small companies typically don't work that well with ETFs. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. But if you're investing in big companies, bank accounts, um, if you're investing in bonds, these m- types of things tend to be perfect for ETFs. And no, fortunately, those are the things that typically make up like most of people's wealth, mm-hmm. except their property, which is the house that they live in. Yeah. But that's a different thing altogether. Yeah. So, Kate, th- th- all that said, <laughs> where does an ETF fit in? Yes. So, coming into... If you're going on this journey of trying to work out what ETF you want, I think the first thing you need to start with is what type of category you want. So you want something for your core portfolio. And the example we're going to run through in the rest of this series is you want to get a core ETF that invests in the top 200 Australian companies. And so firstly, you need to identify that. You need to identify what does your overall portfolio strategy going to look like? And that is something that you're not going to figure out just from listening to this podcast episode. It's going to require a bit more research, Mm. listening to some of our other investing podcasts, maybe taking our ETF investing course and just really broadening your research. So you're going to have to do a bit of background work here so you actually know what are the different things I can invest in? Because if you've never sort of thought about investing before, it takes a while to sort of open up your mind to the fact that, oh, Disney is a company. I can buy shares in Disney. I can also buy an ETF that owns shares in Disney. And so you kind of have to make that switch to think from, go from being a consumer to being an investor. But once you've worked out, okay, this is what I want in my portfolio. I want to invest a certain percentage of my core portfolio in the top 200 Australian companies. I think an ETF is going to get me there. Then working out how that so how that fits, and so doing some research. And we're going to in the next episode get into how do you actually then find different options and how do you compare them. Mm. Yeah, and so you know there there are many different ways you can invest in ETFs, which we'll get to as well. But for the most part, like you know, you can use ETFs to build a large part of your wealth. So if you've got a property, you might want to pay down your mortgage. And then the other option might be, do I invest in ETFs? Mm -hmm. Now, if you're a little bit older, say like you were 45 or 50 and you were thinking of retirement, you might change it slightly. You might reorder your preferences. You might go, pay down my mortgage and invest in super before ETFs. Okay. Because at that age, you're thinking, I can access my super in 10 or 15 years and that's a lower tax environment. So that's where it starts to become a little bit different. But for most, what we call accumulators, young people, so, and by that I mean anyone, you know, below 50 uh, in this instance, you can probably think of ETFs as kind of your your number one tool in your strategy. Cool. So as long as you have your strategy, you know you want to build wealth, you've got a goal in mind, ETFs can probably get you most of the way there. And so, Kate, there's this question that people ask, and it's a fantastic question because it is the most obvious. Does the price of the thing, the ETF, you know, I see it on Google, I see it in my brokerage account. Does that price matter? Yeah. So when we look at individual companies, the price does matter a lot more. But when we're looking at ETFs, the price of the ETF that you see in your brokerage account or on the news or in Google Finance, it doesn't really matter because you are more interested in what is in that basket and the value of everything in there. So it just really matters how much you cut it up. Yeah. So like you could have, say, a $100 pizza and you cut it up 10 ways, it's $10 a slice. Mm-hmm. Now you could have the same pizza, but you could cut it up 100 ways and it's $1 a slice. Okay. Does that mean that the one that's $10 is better than the one that's $1? No. It yeah. just means that there's 10 times the amount. Yeah, like, so it just more means of it. you have more. You, see, you have more, yeah. yeah. So, and that's the way it works with a lot of these ETFs. The thing is, some of the ETFs started a very long time ago. And so what's happened is, as they've gone up in price, the price has kept on going up. So some of the newer ETFs have a smaller price on them, but they really represent the same thing uh, and they just have a bigger slice of it. Okay. And that's really the only difference. Yep. The thing, as we were talking about, is that um, sometimes if you only have $500 to invest, there's one ETF, the IVV ETF, which is an ETF that invests in the United States. Okay. 
Yeah. Um, it's a really popular ETF, one of the most popular. Mm-hmm. That's I think that's about five hundred dollars for one. Oh wow. <laughs> right. So if you were going to invest in that one, you could choose one of those or find one that's about twenty five or fifty dollars. Yeah. In which you get ten pieces. It really doesn't matter at the end okay. of the day. You can just go with whatever. Yeah. Um, you know, we actually has hap- so it happens at the time of this recording. We actually recommend the IVV ETF, the one that's five hundred dollars. You know, if you had five hundred bucks, you probably wouldn't want to choose that one because you'd only get one. They yeah. wouldn't give you half of or a quarter of one. Yeah. So you want to choose one that's smaller. And in that case, you would get a full amount. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. Is there like any better way to go? Like I know you said you get more. Like if you get more, is that better? Well, it all just depends on how much you actually want to invest. Okay. So if you, it doesn't matter if like if you have – like if we go back to the pizza analogy, one of the pizzas was $10 a slice and another one was $1. Mm-hmm. You might have one and I might have 10 Yeah. It doesn't actually make a difference because they both cost ten dollars at the end of the day. Like our investment in the pizza was both ten dollars. Right. So it wouldn't matter if you had one of those and I had ten of these, or you had ten of those and I had one of these. Okay. So it doesn't really matter. Okay. So it's just the same. Yeah, and this is the same thing with shares. Like people are like, well, Commonwealth Bank is this high and National Australia Bank is only half of that. Shouldn't I just is it Commonwealth Bank better? Yeah. But it doesn't really matter. What actually matters is how fast things go up. Okay. So if you think about your investment in the pizza, the pizza might go up 10%. Right. Now, 10% on $10 is takes it to $11. Yeah. 10% of $1 takes it to $1.10. It's still 10%. Doesn't yeah. matter which one you you're focusing on. We want the growth. Yeah. And so it doesn't really matter how many actual units you have. Okay. Yeah, there I mean there are some tiny little devil in the details here, but for the most part for this series, we don't need to worry about that. We yeah. can just focus on just invest. Yep. Yeah. Um, and find the one that you can buy round numbers of. Like, that would be good. Like, I just looked at another ETF here, which is the VGS ETF. It's the International Shares ETF from Vanguard. It's $94. So, if you invested $500, you'd get around five of these. Cool. Um, whereas, you'd only get one and a bit of the other one. You can't really get a bit. So, yeah, you'd probably be better off with this one. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, they're slightly different, but it just gives you an example. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. So that's, I think that's about it for. Yeah, I think they're the, the main points that we wanted to cover. Yeah. Do you have any questions? He explained everything really well. As I was thinking of questions, you were answering them. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, cool. So, um, okay, so the next episode will be interesting. You can actually uh, send us your questions as well, you can use the link in the show notes. We will do a bit of a ETF Q&A towards the end. If Monique didn't ask you any questions that you really wanted answered, if you have listened to this as your first episode, please go back to number one. And that will answer some questions. And we'll continue on from here. We've got a free Google Doc to go along with this series, which is in the show notes. So make sure you grab a hold of that. And that will give you uh, a good tool to use for tomorrow's episode when we get into researching ETFs, specifically ASX 200 ETFs. Yeah, and it will show you how to like do a checklist for investing. So yes. go and check that out. Kate, thanks for joining me. Thanks for listening, everyone. Mini Pizza slash Monique, thanks for joining us. <laughs> Anytime. Great. See you in the next episode.